Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of KU Presents from the Green Room. I'm Brian Zelmer, director of KU Presents uh, and uh, at Kutztown University. And during these, uh, the time that we're calling an intermission from our live shows, where all of our venues are, are closed down and, and uh, we can't have live audiences right now, we are trying to bring artists and professionals in the arts world to you through this program. Uh, so we'll be speaking with performers, administrators, educators, and you're welcome to be part of this conversation. All you have to do is just enter something into the comments, or if you're watching this at another time and want to ask questions for a future guest, simply send me an email, zelmer at kutztown.edu. So let's get to, to today's guest. Um, we have David Gross, who's the executive director of Reading Symphony Orchestra. During Gross's time with the RSO, the orchestra has experienced growth through collaborations with other arts groups and the RSO's first appearance at the Frederick Mann uh, Center for the Performing Arts in Philadelphia. Um, he's, here's, uh, I want to first show you, before I bring him on, a snippet of a recent virtual performance that they did um, with the symphony. It was their free live stream back on January 23rd in a program they titled Mendelssohn Italian. <laughs> All right, let's welcome David to the screen. Brian, thank you for Hi. having me. Hi, David. Uh, it's great to have you. Do you mind just before we get into uh, a lot of the other discussion that I have planned for today, can you just give us a, a snippet of what the uh, RSO is about and uh, maybe a little bit of its history? Sure. Well, the, uh, the Reading Symphony Orchestra is in its 108th season wow. of continuous performing. Uh, we slowed down a little bit this past year, uh, I think as everybody did, uh, but as you noted, we uh, presented a live stream concert on January 23rd. Uh, we actually have another uh, live stream this coming Saturday night, March 6th, uh, and we're going to be featuring David Kim, uh, the concertmaster of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and the program's going to be the Elgar String Serenade. Uh, the Mozart uh, Violin Concerto Number no. Four and Beethoven's First Symphony, uh, okay. and uh, along with our concerts, uh, we have a pretty extensive education program uh, with our youth symphony, our junior string orchestra, and for several years now, we have been featuring a, a program called the Orchestra Zone, where we have uh, music teachers go into the Reading uh, School District and uh, provide free instrumental lessons to students in the Reading schools. And that has continued uh, this year, but those lessons currently are all virtual. Great. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about the RSO in, in just a moment, but first I wanna talk a little bit about you and your history. Uh, I've read your bio and you were a, a professional timpanist for over 30 years. Um, do you still get to play, first of all? Do you have like a timpani room in your house? Or? <laughs> no, I actually gave that up. Uh, oh, okay. I think the last time I played was probably around five years ago. Um, I was fortunate enough that the uh, last performance that I did was uh, with on, the, on my favorite piece in the repertoire, which is Mahler's Second Symphony. And I was asked to come in and play extra with the Milwaukee Symphony with Edo DeVar uh, conducting. And it was, it was a great opportunity for me and uh, a nice way to uh, finish my performing career. Nice. Now, as a timpanist, you were the principal timpani uh, player for uh, Grand Rapids Symphony, Kansas City. I'm just going to go through the litany real quick. Uh, you <laughs> played You played with Detroit, Indianapolis. You mentioned Milwaukee, Columbus, and even here in uh, our backyard, Philadelphia. Um, having experienced, from an artist's point of view, having experienced all these different uh, regional symphonies and orchestras, can you just help maybe some of our people watching who, who maybe have only ever been to one symphony, or, you know, go to, to just the Reading Symphony Orchestra or wherever they might be, um, are there differences? Are they nuanced? Are they major between um, how the different symphonies operate? 
Oh, yes. Well, uh, the first thing is the acoustics in every one of these halls is remarkably different. So how you blend uh, with an orchestra is going to change according to the room that you're with. So uh, when they call you to come in and play extra and substitute whatever, um, you kind of have to be able to ad adapt on the fly, so to speak. Um, and uh, so it, it was really, I think, a great learning experience for me. Um, and uh, so a, a great privilege to play with a lot of these orchestras and then learning uh, the different nuances of the various conductors. Um, you know, do you play right on their beat? Do you play a little bit behind the beat? That type of thing. And every orchestra is a little different about that. So you, again, have to uh, feel that out very quickly. Now, are there missions and like is the purpose that they have for themselves all pretty similar? Do they line up or are there differences there too in terms of the, the mission that they have for their community? Well, um, I think that uh, obviously uh, every orchestra's, uh, the, their performance mission is very similar. Uh, uh, but then once you get beyond that, um, so how dedicated they are to various uh, forms of educational programming is going to uh, vary. Um, some uh, cities have a separate youth symphony program, which would be a separate organization completely uh, from the symphony there. When I was in uh, uh, with the San Antonio Symphony, the youth symphony there was a great youth symphony, uh, but it was a totally separate organization from the San Antonio Symphony. Um, but uh, the flip side of that is when I was a musician in the Grand Rapids Symphony, uh, the Grand Rapids Youth Symphony was part of uh, the Grand Rapids Symphony. And that gave me actually my first um, taste of being a manager because my first manager's position was uh, being the manager of the Grand Rapids Youth Symphony for a few years. Very cool. uh, uh, go that, ahead. Leads, that leads into our first question, uh, serious question of the day. And it's I usually um, ask these questions at the end of the the time with my guests, but this question made sense up in the beginning. It's from our commercial music students here on campus at uh, Kutztown University. Um, they ask, what are some of the responsibilities an orchestra's executive director has? In other words, what does an or orchestra's executive director do? Well, sure. Um, uh, the, one of the first responsibilities that I have is uh, collaborating with the music director in uh, establishing uh, whatever upcoming season is and working very collaboratively uh, with them. I'm very fortunate here that Andrew Constantine, the music director of the Reading Symphony Orchestra, and myself, we work very well together. Um, obviously, my um, uh, interest in that relationship tends to be a little bit more focused on the business side and the financial side since um, uh, my responsibilities to the organization is uh, raising money um, and uh, making sure the bills get paid, negotiating uh, the various contracts. Um, and uh, But uh, with my background as a musician and then Andrew's um, good, keen understanding of the financial side of things, uh, we work very well together in coming up with that. Um, as I mentioned, my other responsibilities are um, we would have to negotiate a collective bargaining agreement with the musicians, negotiating guest artist contracts, venue contracts, uh, and uh, also with uh, various vendors, uh, and then also with hiring of staff and managing the staff. So uh, it, it's a rather busy job. <laughs> it is. Um, so... In, uh, not talking now during COVID, but before COVID, what was your calendar like? How far in advance did you do your planning? Um, and, and maybe you can give us a little background or, or behind the scenes look at how you and the artistic director will, will put together the season or the program. Well, uh, we're working on well, first of all, we have the 21-22 season completely uh, programmed already, and we're already looking ahead to 22-23. Um, and, uh, you know, there is this kind of moving pieces around to for things to line up uh, between the availability of dates in the hall that we perform in the Santander Performing Arts Center uh, and then dates the a guest artist availability. And then um, our music director also is the music director of the Fort Wayne Philharmonic. 
So uh, it's also coordinating dates with the Fort Wayne Philharmonic. Uh, and then we also have to be sensitive to uh, the dates of other local orchestras because some of the musicians that would play in the Reading Symphony also might play in the Lancaster Symphony or the Delaware Symphony. And we want to try to avoid conflicts uh, because we want our musicians to, uh, to make, uh, obviously make as much money as they can. So That's great, that's great. So how, how we talked about your live stream that you just had. How does an orchestra survive something like this pandemic where our industry had to just shut down? We, you know, we had a lot of, uh, of difficulty and, um, you know, an, an orchestra is not a small organization. So how right. do you stay afloat? What are the ways that, you know, what are your life vests and, and wraps or whatever you want to call it? Well, we have an advantage that we have a history of 108 years. And so we have a lot of very dedicated patrons and donors, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, and they have uh, helped to make um, our, uh, let's say, navigating through this past year possible. Uh, there are a number of local uh, foundations and a few national ones that uh, have been very supportive. Um, and uh, have allowed us to be able to do things like uh, these live streams that we've begun doing. And we were also able to get uh, PPP funds to pay our musicians. Um, and we felt it was very important, especially uh, going into uh, January and, and beyond. Uh, we were able to get a second round of the PPP money uh, and we're going to be paying our musicians out, all of the musicians for all of the services that they would have uh, performed for the balance of the season, uh, because they're our product and we, we need to take care of them so that when we come back full strength, they're there for us. That's great. I'm glad you're able to do that. And I'm sure they are as well. Um, I know education outreach is a very important thing, not just for the Reading Symphony Orchestra, but for you personally, it's been part of your career. Um, yes. A lot of schools right now aren't allowing, you know, artists to come visit their their buildings. They're not allowed to take trips to come see you. Are you able to still engage with K through 12 students and and university students, um, you know, during this time? What what are you doing to to stay in touch with them? Well, yes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our orchestra zone program is functioning uh, virtually right now. Um, we're, right now, we're focusing mainly on the high school and a little bit the middle school level, but we're about to uh, try to re-engage uh, with the elementary students again. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, uh, the Youth Symphony and the Junior Strings, they're meeting um, in the ballroom of the Abraham Lincoln Hotel. Uh, and that room is big enough to allow for social distancing there. We are only having string players for uh, both those groups right now. Uh, and the hope is, of course, that by next fall, we'll, we'll be back at full strength with winds, brass, and percussion. Um, uh, I, myself, personally, uh, I've been asked to do a few lectures at universities, uh, and that's been all by uh, Zoom or, uh, you know, whatever uh, platform the school uses. And, and so we've been able to um, keep our education mission moving forward just maybe a little slower than it had been previously. Mm -hmm. So with your youth orchestra, I want to go back to that. You said you, um, you've been playing virtually together. Um, well, no, the youth, the youth symphony is actually uh, rehearsing uh, in person. Oh, I, see, I see. It's the orchestra zone that is, um, uh, well, t they're doing the lessons virtually. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, but the, the, with the, uh, the youth symphony, uh, you know, we uh, took some time to investigate the appropriate protocols uh, and parents have been really good about helping out with this um, and uh, disinfecting the room, the chairs, mm -hmm. all the students are wearing masks, uh, we're social distancing uh, and uh, they've done a um, uh, recorded streamed concert for their winter program and we're investigating sites for an outdoor concert uh, so that uh, parents can come and see the students perform live uh, in May around the end of the season. That's wonderful. Um, I I'm glad and I'm sure the, the parents and all those students are, are very glad that you're able to accommodate that using the technology. Uh, we heard about that last week when we talked with um, one of our professors here and how they're engaging you know, using this technology too with the, the university students. Um, 
another serious question. I'm sorry, David. It, I don't know what it is about Symphony that brings up the serious questions. But sure. How, how serious of a problem is crinkling of candy wrappers? <laughs> um, that that's always a serious problem, um, and uh, uh, you know you, you you always put these little um, uh, do's and don'ts in the program book, and you know we we always ask get your candy out before the concert starts or in between pieces. Uh, most people uh, you know uh, follow that; a few people don't. Um, and, and the reason why that's an issue is all of our concerts are recorded uh, mm -hmm. and, and at times we broadcast those on radio uh, or we might use them uh, for grant applications. And so it's important that we get as uh, a, a clean of a recording, uh, you might say, as possible. Um, and it's also just a um, consideration thing for uh, patrons uh, who are sitting together and uh, the person not crinkling the candy doesn't want to hear that. So Absolutely. And in fact, there's been serious brawls. Uh, I think it was Norway two or three years ago uh, yep. where somebody got to a brawl over. It started a brawl in at a symphony because of a candy wrapper. Uh, I, I, th I think there was one also in the Boston Symphony a few wow, years back. Wow, and, yeah. and so, uh, uh, yeah, it's some people take it very seriously. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I know, uh, what was it, a few years back, uh, the New York Philharmonic uh, performance came to a screaming halt because uh, somebody's phone went off in it, and they were doing Mahler's Sixth Symphony, and Alan Gilbert stopped the, the orchestra and turned around, and uh, I, I'm sure the person who had the phone was uh, very embarrassed, and so we always make sure we ask people to uh, turn off their phones before the concert starts. So, so orchestras are, are steeped in a lot of tradition, or a lot of people think of them that way. Um, you know, like dressing up a certain way, not clapping between movements and these mm -hmm. types of things. Um, do you see any of these? I've read on the Reading Symphony Orchestra's, um, you know, things to know before the show type of thing. They address the, the dress code, for instance, and basically the bottom line is dress how you're comfortable. Right. Um, and uh, but what I'm trying to get out to is a little bit deeper, um, you know, in this day and age where we're we're focusing a lot. Um, as we should be on diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Where do you see the future of symphonies? What do you think will are the important parts that we'll take from these traditions and carry them forward? But also, where where are we? Where's the new direction going to be? What are the you know? Do we have that figured out yet? I know we're still you know in, early in conversations about this, but um. uh, I I think it's a good point, a really important subject to uh, address. Um, access and diversity uh, in our industry, our industry being symphony orchestras, I, th I think is an important thing. Uh, and I I've always said that uh, symphony orchestras kind of painted themselves in a corner uh, a while back when they started this, um, what, they, uh, what you might call um, uh, either elitist or snooty uh, attitude of everybody, you know, and the audience has to get dressed up. And of course, everybody's in tails or tuxes on stage. And uh, basically, it, it doesn't make everybody feel comfortable. So a lot of times, the, the very people that we're trying to uh, attract and come to the hall are intimidated by the, the, the very trappings that we have established. And so I'm a big fan of um, tearing those, some of those traditions down so that uh, people are comfortable uh, coming to a concert. And I also think it's important that for the orchestra to get out of the hall and go to other locations so that uh, people in various neighborhoods, people in various communities truly feel like the symphony is there. Well, I, I love the things that I read about the Reading Symphony Orchestra and, and in all transparency, you and I, um, go to uh, meetings together with the uh, Burke, it used to be Burke's Arts Council, now it's Burke's yeah. Arts. And yeah. so, uh, you know, I love hearing about all of the, the innovative ways you guys are looking forward and, and just, um, I, I wish you the best in another 150 years or whatever. Um, <laughs> so we're out of time, but I wanna give you a chance, if you can remind us what you have coming up again, or if there's anything you didn't mention that you wanna let us know about. Well, sure. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a uh, live stream concert this Saturday evening. 
7.30. Uh, for those of you who would like to tune in, you can go to the Reading Symphony's website, www.readingsymphony.org, um, and there will be a link there to click on and to take you to our YouTube website. Um, and we hope you would enjoy the concert. We also have a digital program book uh, for people to read and enjoy during the concert. Uh, we also have a concert coming up April 17th. Uh, we're going to be featuring the great pianist Stuart Goodyear playing the Beethoven Fourth Piano Concerto. And uh, May, set, May 15th, excuse me, will be our final concert of the year. And we're going to be featuring uh, the principal Charles from the Philadelphia Orchestra doing, doing the Tchaikovsky Rococo variations. So uh, please uh, keep your eye out for more information about those programs. And uh, when we can, we hope everybody uh, begins to attend uh, live concerts again. Thank you, David. I appreciate you and, I, and the symphony, and I wish you the best. Thank you for coming on from the green room, and we'll talk to you soon. Brian, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Um, you can learn more about the orchestra, as uh, he mentioned, and we have the website up, writingsymphony.org. I want to thank you all for tuning in, and uh, please help us spread the word, let people know what we're doing, and, and be part of the conversation. Uh, join us with your comments, if you can, or send me an email in advance. Uh, and next week, I can tell you our guest is multiple Emmy award-winning TV and movie composer, Jeremy Zuckerman. I'm super excited to speak with Jeremy next week. Um, and for now, that's, it, our, that's our program for today. I'm Brian Zelmer for KU Presents. And until we get to say our usual tagline of see you at Schaefer, we'll see you here next week from the green room. <laughs>